Welcome everyone. We're so glad to have you with us this morning for an up close look at some of our favorite fossil finds discovered right here in the middle of Los Angeles. Thank you for joining us. To view live closed captions in English and Spanish, please click on the external link we have dropped in the chat. For our guests watching on YouTube, the link to closed captions in English and Spanish is in the video description below. So good morning again. My name is Agnes and I work with the education team at La Brea Tar Pits. So as you can tell, I'm not at the museum right now. I'm at home like many of you, but we do have some amazing staff that still need to go into the museum to help take care of our excavation sites and fossils. We'll try to get to as many questions as we can and Sean might even answer some of them during his presentation. But if we don't get to answer your questions today, I encourage you to write it down so you can learn more about the animal on your own. So if you'd like, go ahead and grab a piece of paper and a pencil so you can record your experience while you're watching today. You can note down any of those questions you have, maybe a few facts you learned, or draw a rate of description of what the fossil looks like. And we love fan art of our fossils, so if you have a picture you'd like to share with your teacher, they're, out, they're welcome to email it to the school programs team. So to give you an idea of where Sean is joining us from today, I want to share this map of Han Hancock Park with you. If you've visited our museum before, this may look familiar to you. So Sean is right here in pits 61 and 67, right beside Project 23, our current excavation site, and then pit 91 that is right here. So Sean Campbell, who I've mentioned already, is one of our fossil preparators at the museum, and he has an awesome fossil find that he will share with us today. So let's go ahead and get started. I'm going to switch my camera over to Sean so we can meet today's Ice Age animal and you'll see me again in a little bit. Hi there, Sean. How are things out in the pits today? Hi, how are you? It's good to see you and it's good to see everybody uh, virtually. Welcome to Pit 6167 at the La Brea Tar Pits. Behind me are act is actually a deposit that was excavated in the early 1900s. And they found over a thousand uh, individual bones of bison in this exact spot where I'm sitting right here. And so I have a few replicas of some of the fossils uh, that would have been found back in those, back in like, between 1913 and 1915. And so this is a bison antiquus uh, skull with the horns and everything. And then there's a jaw right here uh, that has its teeth as well as there's a replica of a foot. So even though this looks like it might be an entire leg, it's just the front foot of a bison antiquus. So I just wanted to show you some of the fossils in scale in relation to myself so you can see what sorts of things we're really dealing with uh, before we move on to our presentation. So, these are some images of recent finds of bison that we found at Project 23. So Project 23, we've been excavating on since 2008. And over the last like three to four years, these are just some of the, of the bison fossils that we've uncovered in those excavations. So in the top left, you see a metapodial bone, which is uh, if you feel your hand, uh, that's actually your metacarpal. So metapodial just means it's either a metatarsal or a metacarpal. But if you feel in your hand and you feel from your wrist all the way to your knuckle, that's a metapodial. And so this is a really large metapodial bone from a bison. Next to that on the right, uh, there is a skull fragment. So it's a frontal skull fragment from a baby bison with the horn core right there. Uh, so that's a, that was a really cool find when we uncovered that. And then there's uh, toe bones that we found. So in the hand of the next photo, in, in the next photo over, you can see a first phalanx or first toe uh, in comparison to a replica foot. Uh, so you can see where that toe actually goes. And then there's a lot of uh, denaries or jaw bones that have been found uh, specifically in box 13. So some of these fossils are relatively aged at about 32,000 years old. Uh, but we also find other things that we didn't show here like vertebrae and ribs and all sorts of other elements from the skeleton of bison individuals uh, that are thousands and tens of thousands of years old found right here at the La Brea Tar Pits. Uh, but we're gonna move on to the next slide of our presentation.
And uh, this is showing us a lineup of different species of bison that lived in North America at different times. So not all of these bison are found at the La Brea Tar Pits. And they're lined up in, uh, in a, uh, graded in size. So bison latifrons is the largest bison to ever live. And we actually find bison latifrons here at the La Brea Tar Pits. And we're gonna talk about it a little bit more. Um, and then bison antiquus is a little bit smaller than latifrons. It also is found at the La Brea Tar Pits. So those are the two species that we're gonna talk about today in more detail. Uh, bison priscus, which is the middle bison right there, that's a little bit smaller still, is actually the older bison out of all of those in the lineup. It, it, it's actually the one that uh, moved into North America. So bison actually evolved in Eurasia, so uh, different parts of Asia and Europe. And during certain times, during, uh, during the current ice age, the sea level has changed. And sometimes when the water level is higher, Asia and Alaska are separated by the Bering Straits, uh, so ocean water. But when sea level drops, which has happened multiple times throughout geologic history, there's a Bering Land Bridge that connects Asia to North America, specifically to Alaska, uh, which is an area known as Beringia. And so bison priscus is the bison that migrated from Asia across Beringia into Alaska. And then there it diversified and speciated into other species, but all the species of bison in North America were kind of locked in Alaska and parts of Canada and the really far North for a while. And then eventually there was corridors and passageways that opened up through the ice sheets and they were able to migrate farther south. And this is the actual definition of the Rancho La Brea North American land mammal age. And so that age is about 200 to 240,000 years ago, bison migrated uh, below 55 degrees latitude into the contiguous United States and other areas of North America. And that specific event is what uh, scientists use to delineate that Rancho La Brea North American land mammal age. Now, the rest of the bison in this lineup, bison ox and talus, <clears throat> that's extremely closely related to Antiquus and lived partly contemporaneously at the very end and then into the Holocene and past the extinction event. Um, and then bison bison, which is the last bison, which is also the smallest bison, uh, is the only living representative and it evolved from um, Antiquus and Occidentalis later on during the Holocene, approximately 5,000 years ago or so. Um, and so those are the bison of North America and there's many more subspecies and things like that, which we don't have time to go into. Uh, but we're gonna move on to the next slide. And we're gonna talk about the modern bison just for a quick second. Uh, just to tell you that there's actually two different subspecies of the modern day bison. So most of you are probably most familiar with the plains bison. So the species is, the genus and species is bison bison, and then the subspecies is again bison. So the plains bison, which most of you are familiar with that live in places like Yellowstone, uh, are that specific subspecies. There's also another subspecies of bison bison, known as bison bison athabasque. And that lives farther north in places like Canada and Alaska, which is delineated by the red area on the map. So both of these subspecies live today in North America. There's also living species that are in Europe, uh, but we're not gonna talk about them today. Uh, you can actually tell the differences between these two different subspecies based on the their overall size. The wood bison has a slightly more vertical and larger hump. The tail is a little bit longer. The hair kind of poofs off to the side a little bit. But for the most part, it's pretty hard to tell the differences between these bison, but they are different subspecies. And then we're going to move on and we're going to talk about bison antiquus. So bison antiquus is the largest herbivore that is found at the La Brea uh, Tarp. I mean, uh, it's the most common large herbivore. Sorry, it's not the largest herbivore. It's the most common large herbivore found at the La Brea Tarpets. So in our collections, 
uh, there's over 13,000 individual bones that have been identified that belong to bison antiquus. Uh, most of the deposits that contain uh, fossils contain the bison. So not every single one, but almost every single one. It's a very, very common animal to find at the La Brea tar pits. Um, and as you can see, it has extremely large neural spines. Those vertebrae are very large, especially fairly close to the neck. Uh, for its large hump, and it's it was larger than the modern day species of bison that exists today, uh, but it's very very closely related to the modern day uh, species of bison. Um, and they lived in a wide variety of areas of North America, but we find them in large numbers right here at the La Brea Tar Pits, and they're probably a herding species of bison, meaning they were gregarious and they lived in very large uh, social communities. Uh, and we're going to, the other thing about, and sorry, one second. The other thing about Antiquus is that uh, it seems that they were migrating through the La Brea area because scientists a few decades ago noticed that the teeth of the bison Antiquus, as far as their ontogeny or what they, uh, as far as their development, we had around two to four month olds and then we had a year to two and four month olds. And then after that, they're more or less adults as far as the fusion of their bones and their size and everything like that. So because they were only here during certain time periods based off of how old they were when we find their remains in the La Brea Tar Pits, we think they were probably migrating through the Los Angeles area and specifically at La Brea and getting trapped and hunted around this area in the uh, deposit, and we find them in the deposits. So moving on, we're also going to talk about bison latifrons. So again, this was the largest bison that ever existed. Uh, and we find very few remains here at the La Brea Tar Pits. So there's only 48 individual bones that have ever been identified at La Brea. So we can't even uh, recreate an entire skeleton because we have so few bones that have been identified um, and found. They're only found in seven different deposits. Uh, so just so you all know, the La Brea Tar Pits has been excavating for over a hundred years and we have something around 130 deposits, maybe even more that have been excavated. Um, so they've only been found in seven deposits, very few in number. Um, and we, we can't create um, a skeleton made out of real bones because we just don't have enough of them to recreate a skeleton. Uh, and they're probably more solitary. So Antiquus uh, was probably one of the earliest bison to really get into large, very vast herds. Um, whereas Latifrons probably lived uh, either solitary or in very small social groups, maybe a uh, little bit bigger than family units, maybe a few uh, groups of families, but very, if they lived in uh, very small herds, they were very, very small just because across uh, different areas, you don't find huge vast numbers of them uh, in any deposit in particular uh, that are of the same uh, age. So moving on, there's something called sexual dimorphism in bison. And this is true for modern bison. And we use modern bison to extrapolate and understand behaviors based off of fossil evidence. So the modern day bison came from the extinct bison that we know of as Antiquus and Latifrons and all that sort of stuff. So we can extrapolate behaviors and uh, different types of things. So sexual dimorphism, males are larger than females and they do slightly different things. And so one of the reasons the males get so much larger is that they're competing to breed. Uh, and so when that happens during the breeding season, also known as the rut, the Males will actually try and uh, pivot towards each other and stand off towards each other and try and scare one another off and say, look how big I am. Uh, if we fight, you're going to get hurt, so don't even try. And when they're similar in size, they'll actually have competitions and battle each other and go horn to horn um, and battle it out and compete over the females. Now, the females are a little bit smaller in size. And you can see their heads aren't as wide and they're not as robust. Uh, they still have large horns. Uh, they compete between themselves for the best areas to forage and eat and things like that. They 
in the plains, they eat mostly grasses. In other areas, they uh, will browse uh, and things like that. And uh, yeah, they'll actually run through the herd uh, to try and get the males to compete over them. And then we're gonna move on to the next slide. And they also do something called wallowing behavior. So the bison will paw the ground and then sit in the dirt and then wallow and uh, uh, kind of swish around a little bit. And this is done probably for thermoregulation uh, because they are woolly animals that live in areas that get a little bit warmer. So the dirt helps uh, kind of reflect the heat so that the heat uh, doesn't, you know, they don't get overheated. And then also they might be using it as insect repellent and other things like that. And the males will actually use it as social cues because they'll urinate on the dust and then they'll wallow in it. And then it sends chemical signals that talk about testosterone levels and other things. It's pretty cool and crazy. Um, and then moving on. So the herding behavior, again, only certain bison would be in really vast herds, but Antiquas probably did and definitely modern bison do today. Um, and the herds of bison uh, that lived were in the millions. So the estimated amount of living bison before the arrival of Europeans was somewhere around 30 million potentially, which is crazy to think about that many uh, animals living on the landscape in North America uh, just a few hundred years ago, which is amazing. And then we're gonna move on to the next slide. And I just wanna talk about that muscular hump really quick. So the bison are actually cold adapted. So they got up into the cold parts of Asia, crossed Beringia and came down into North America. And that was during uh, different uh, warm and cold glacials and interglacials, but snow was there at minimum different seasons or there almost uh, at, for different lengths of time. And what the hump was actually for is it's a bone and muscle attachment so that they could swing their big heads and use it as a shovel to move snow around so that they could get to the grass and other plants that were beneath the snow line so that they so they could continue to eat during the winter times because they don't hibernate uh, like bears and other things that you might be aware of that hibernate. They don't do that. They exist through the winter by continuing to graze and eat plants by shoveling all that snow out of the way. And then they also use it to uh, combat each other. So the males will have larger humps and larger heads for when they're combating each other. So that's another reason their humps might be so large. And then moving on to the next slide. Uh, their limbs and toes are heavily modified. So they're referred to as ungulates. So ungulates are animals that walk on their tippy toes and bison are artiodactyls, which means that they have uh, even toes. They actually have two toes on each foot. And their hoof is actually the last toe. So that's, their, that's the tippy toe that we're talking about. Their hoof is a modified toe that they walk on and then their toes go straight up and the metapodial bone is actually part of the foot. And then you get into the radial ulna as well as the humerus, which all, are all part of the leg. You see that there's not a lot of meat on that leg. There's you know, limited uh, muscle and tendons and they're not a really big beefy leg. And that's for efficiency. So even though they're an extremely large animal, their legs are actually fairly slender and that uh, makes them a more efficient runner. Um, so also the way that their tendons uh, string all the way from their toes, all the way up their, uh, their metapodials, it, al it almost acts like a spring. So they get about a 30 to 50% return of energy because they are essentially on pogo stick legs running around and prancing and it's and galloping and things like that. So it's just a little bit of fun. Uh, and we're gonna move on to the next slide. And they're also known as ruminants. So this is really important. So many animals are ruminants. You might've heard of things like cows being, having four chambers of their stomach. And this is also true for bison as well as many other species that are foregut fermenters. And what it is, is they're called ruminants because one of those chambers is called the rumen. And so in particular, bison will eat things like grass, and then the grass is really hard to break down. And so the grass will go into the rumen, and then it'll get digested a little bit by different microbes and other things that live in their digestive tract. And then they'll regurgitate 
regurgitate it back into their mouth. And so if you've ever heard of chewing the cud, that, that's what's going on is they're bringing a, a, essentially a fist sized ball of partially digestive matter back into their mouth and then they chew it more and then they send it back and down into the digestive tract where the microbes continue to break it down. So grasses and other plants have uh, evolved a lot of different defenses. So some of them are really uh, hard to break down because of what they're made out of and all of uh, the cellulose and all that different types of stuff. But then also uh, different plants have chemical toxins and tannins and things like that. So different types of microbes will be living in different chambers. Um, and the, the chambers, the bison and other animals have evolved those chambers to hold that gut bacteria so that the gut bacteria can break down those plants and it's a symbiosis. So the bacteria get to proliferate inside the digestive tract, but the animal gets to get some of the nutrients out of a very nutrient poor uh, uh, grass and other plants. And so that's one of the reasons that they've evolved these incredible digestive systems uh, and why they're known as ruminants. And then we're gonna move on. And then we're gonna end with human hunting. So bison again, evolved in Eurasia. The top left picture is uh, actually from Spain. And so that's, uh, and that, that was made over 30,000 years ago by a human being in that piece of artwork. And so the humans of that time in that area were already hunting bison over 30,000 years ago. Um, but if we move into the next uh, few pictures that we can see, we can see the Native Americans that lived in North America, uh, some of them, their ancestors were hunting bison and other animals as they migrated into North America. So they've been hunting bison the whole time and they have developed amazing uh, tactics for uh, finding their prey, hunting their prey and being successful in hunting their prey. So they understand the ecology um, and the behavior of these animals so well that they, uh, created these different tactics. So that first middle picture, you can see two Native American uh, hunters dressed up in wolf skins. And so they would actually, they actually knew that bison are not afraid of a solitary or maybe two wolves. And so they would dress up, they, but, but they are afraid of a pack. So they wouldn't have more than one or two hunters at the time using this technique. And they, by dressing up as wolves, they could get extremely close to the bison and then they could use different projectile points and eventually bows and arrows uh, to hunt the bison and take them down and eat them and then use all of their skins and furs and everything like that. Another te uh, technique that they uh, utilized was something called a buffalo jump. So again, bison are not, uh, the proper term is bison, but we also have been using buffalo for a few hundred years, uh, but they're not actually buffalo, they're bison. Uh, but the buffalo jump is they understood their uh, herd and stampede uh, behavior. And so some people would scare the herd so that they would uh, join a large stampede and just run. And then other individuals would be at uh, specific locations to funnel them in the direction that they wanted to go. And then that was usually a, a cliff or a dangerous area. And the bison would all run off the cliff. And then there would be other Native Americans waiting at the bottom of the cliff uh, to uh, access all the meat and butcher the animals and eat uh, uh, so that everyone could eat them. And then they would, you know, use the furs to make clothes, to make blankets, and they would use the bones for tools. And they would really utilize all of uh, the bison. And then when the horses came, they would hunt bison from horseback, which wasn't until uh, somewhere between the 15 to 1700s. And then the next picture is uh, European arrival and make uh, the creation of the railroads. So when this happened, it was really, it really decimated the bison populations and uh, they would hunt bison actually from trains. Um, and they also used the trains to uh, export all of the furs and everything because there was a really large fur trade. And you can see that uh, horrible image of all of the bison that just that one train took out and they, uh, processed all of those furs and sent them to the East Coast so people could have uh, coats and things like that and hats. Uh, 
um, and they decimated the populations from millions all the way down to maybe only a couple thousand or a few hundred. That's how low the population was at one time. Luckily, now we preserve the bison, and so their numbers are back up to around 400,000. So that's a pretty good success story. Um, and the last image is actually of ranching. So bison today are continuously uh, used as a resource. And so the ranchers will actually raise bison like cattle. And some of you may have, eat, have eaten a bison burger or something like that. So, and that's gonna end our presentation. Hey, thank you for that, Sean. Um, fascinating. Um, so I think that well, we have a lot of questions um, from a lot of our students right now. So I'm gonna actually just jump right in. One of the great things about um, the bison that we study is we, we actually have bison around today. Um, that we can compare with. So some of our students are asking, um, Caitlin asked, can we look at modern bisons? Like how many are in a herd today? And then can we assume that that's what the Ice Age bison were, were living in similar um, social units like that? Yeah, so that's exactly what paleontologists do. It's, it's hard to get the exact um, data for that sort of thing because we've unfortunately killed so many of the bison so we can't see the herds when they were in you know over 30 million which is really incredible to think about that there used to be that many bison on the landscape uh in different social units in large vast herds uh, but we but scientists definitely do that today so modern biologists still study bison and there's uh entire bison preserves in places like montana um, and then there's uh, bison, there's researchers who will even go to areas where bison didn't always exist and then see how that uh, difference of habitat area might also affect bison. So they still do that. So there's bison that live on Catalina Island and on the Channel Islands, which is right next to us uh, on the coast of California. And so bison species did not exist on those Channel Islands until humans brought them over. And so some researchers even study to see how that has differed their behavior and things like that. So definitely a lot of people study modern bison to, under, to understand what's going on today in comparison to the, uh, themselves, but then also extrapolate to understand what was going on in the past with even different species of bison. Uh, and that's where we get most of our understanding from, definitely. And would that help us figure out why some bison went extinct? Giovanni was asking why some of the ancient bison went extinct, but we still have some around today. Yeah, so it's argued about exactly why they went extinct, but some people have different theories or even different theories of why they are the different sizes that they are. So some archaeologists argue that the bison have gotten smaller in size because of human hunting. Um, so because uh, smaller bison that tend to flee were the ones that survived human uh, hunting more often than not, they were successful and reproduced and which led to the modern bison being smaller and more likely to flee and run when they see humans. Um, with things like Antiquus and definitely Latifrons, although Latifrons went extinct uh, potentially before humans even arrived here in, the North, in North America, um, cause they went extinct somewhere between 20 to 30,000 years ago. So it's kind of debated whether or not humans were here and whether or not that's exactly when they went extinct. Um, but I'm kind of getting into the weeds a little bit. We can definitely extrapolate certain, uh, reasons of why things happen to bison or why bison are the way they are today based off of understanding all of that. And of course we know we're a research facility, so we don't have all the answers, right? Then no. that's why we have all these fossils so that we can keep um, trying to discover things. Um, so a couple of students are curious and Ella was asking about the fossils that we do find. So do they always show up all together? Do we get animals in complete um, articulated skeletons? And if not, how do you know what bones are from which animals? How do you know those are toe bones? or jaw bones, and how do you know they're from bison? Yeah, so at the La Brea Tar Pits, the fossils are found uh, disarticulated, which means they're not, uh, the skeleton isn't laid out. We're not finding an entire skeleton. They're all kind of mixed up and jumbled up. And there's 660 different species that we find at La Brea Tar Pits. 
and all of them are all crammed into these deposits all together. Um, so yeah, we don't find them all together, unfortunately, as far as the skeleton. Um, but we know that it's a bison versus something else, uh, mainly because we have comparative collections and we can, we've studied a lot. So different bones are, have different shapes and sizes, something called morphology. And uh, scientists will actually, and paleontologists will use, you know, if they have the opportunity, they'll use a modern, something that's modern. So we have modern species of bison. We can use modern species of bison um, to help identify extinct versions, even though they're bigger and maybe their shapes are slightly different, but they're really close. So we can do that for, you know, mountain lions and bison and all sorts of different types of birds, hawks, eagles. We do that for a lot of different types of things. Uh, we'll use modern uh, skeletons to help us identify uh, the old extinct ones. And then as you go back farther and farther in time, that becomes less helpful. And then they'll do something where you identify a holotype specimen and then use that specimen to compare all of the other individual bones you find and try and figure out what species it is based off of that. And when you find individual bones or fragmentary bones, sometimes that's really hard. And sometimes uh, paleontologists can only identify down to a genus level instead of a species level. Uh, so, yeah. Perfect. So before we just wrap it up, Sean, um, I want to thank you for sharing this information about bison today. And this is your last fossil finds with us for this season. Hopefully you'll join us again next year. Um, did you have a favorite um, fossil finds that you shared? You brought a lot of knowledge to hundreds of students over the past several months. Um, do you have a favorite animal that you like to talk about that our students can maybe go back and watch on YouTube and see one of your other presentations? I really like them all, but sloths are kind of my favorite. I do love sloths and, and that was, the, I think that was the first one that I personally, and this has been a really fun program. I just wish I could see all the students uh, while this was going on. Uh, but you know, some of you, maybe I'll see in the future when you come by the Liberia Tar Pits in person. Perfect. Thanks so much, Sean. I really appreciate you spending your day with us. Take care. Thank you. Good to see you all. And I am going to close us out today. So thank you to our friends and our students for joining us this morning. We learned a lot. I definitely did about North American bison. So if you want to see more from our fossil preparators, please give them a follow on Instagram. Their handle is at La Brea Tar Pits. We'll also have all these videos from these presentations, as I mentioned, on our YouTube channel for you to watch later. And you can catch this recording and others at youtube.com slash the Labrea Tar Pits. So thank you for joining us. We hope to see you again on May 10 at 10.30 a.m. for our last episode this season of Inside the Fossil Lab. And then on May 24th at 10.30, which will be our last episode of Fossil Finds with Laura Chooksbury, one of our other paleontologists. Um, so I hope everyone has a great day and thanks again for spending your morning with us.